the stories that touch your life. This is 2020 Sunday with Barbara Walters, Diane Sawyer, Sam Donaldson, Connie Chung, Charles Gibson, and Hugh Downs. Tonight, a groundbreaking investigation. 2020 goes deep inside the Church of Scientology to show you the raging controversy. What's so secret with this organization? What's so secret with this area? You'll meet the critics. As the door was closing behind me, I didn't know it was a trap. And the converted. I took a course, and my life has never been the same. A movement that's attracted some of the biggest stars in Hollywood, but left some people devastated. I felt that my husband should have rescued me. For the first time, you'll see how disciples reach a higher state with a device called an e-meter. Thank you very much. Your needle is floating. Thank you. What if we have found something that does work? Isn't that worth a look? But you'll hear what some say happens to those who stray. Claims of being locked away in prison camps. There was no way for anyone to reach me. And listen to what this man says about the dirty tricks campaign he waged against defectors. These were enemies of the church. You find their weak spot and you expose it. You literally destroy them. Plus, disturbing accusations about the mysterious death of a young believer. They chose to keep her inside the hotel and watch her die. Scientology, one of the most controversial religions of our times. You can look at the big origins of almost every religion. Mm. In the first so many years, are, they're attacked. Do you feel that, uh, that you need to defend Scientology? No. Never. Tom Gerald, with a rare inside look at Scientology, persecuted religion, or paranoid and secretive cult. You decide. The Church of Scientology. That story tonight, Sunday, December 20th, 1998, after this brief message. Walters and Diane Sawyer. Good evening and welcome to 2020 Sunday. Tonight, in a special hour, we pull back the veil on the Church of Scientology. It is certainly one of the most controversial religions in this country and perhaps the world. Few people outside the church know what goes on within its walls. It's a secret carefully protected by those who believe fervently in its work. And it's unlike almost any other church. There is no worship of God. There is no Bible of God's words. But those who believe say that it has changed their lives forever for the better. Tonight, you will hear from John Travolta and others who credit the church with helping them achieve happiness. But critics claim that Scientology is not a religion. They say it's a dangerous and paranoid cult. And what exactly do they believe? It's always a question. Well, one thing, that you're born with the memory of painful experiences from past lives. Erase them, and you can be happy. Tom Gerald has finished a year-long investigation into the Church of Scientology. Is it a misunderstood religion or a predatory cult? Buried deep in these New Mexico hills, in steel-lined tunnels, said to be able to survive a nuclear blast, is what Scientology considers the future of mankind. Seen here for the first time, thousands of metal records stored in heat-resistant titanium boxes and playable on a solar-powered turntable, all containing the beliefs of Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard. And man can achieve these goals today of freedom for himself and his people through Scientology. Clearly, Scientology believes it's here to stay. Never before have we embarked on such massive expansion, and yet it will soon be reality. And we will be moving into the new millennium with authority. Scientology is on the march. It has powerful political friends and a group of glittering celebrities. Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman, Lisa Marie Presley, Kirstie Alley, and Jenna Elfman. These celebrities have become Scientology's best salespeople. What's great about Scientology is there's you, right? And you're always you. 
But as you go through life, you know, you have the betrayals and the losses and the things. They start clouding up. And what Scientology does is helps take away all that stuff so that you can just be you. It was a teenage wedding and the old folks wished them well. Superstar John Travolta credits the church with his success in films like Pulp Fiction. He joined the church around the time he made his first television appearance in Welcome Back, Cotter. He and actress Kirstie Alley agreed to sit down with 2020 for a rare interview about their religion. Why did you turn to Scientology? Why have you chosen Scientology? I was 21 when uh, I first heard about it, and um, uh, someone introduced it to me, and they were so certain and happy, and I wasn't used to be people being certain and happy. I was used to people being insecure and unhappy. Um, I took a course, and my life has never been the same. Years before Kirstie Alley joined the cast of Cheers, she was a struggling actress, hooked on drugs. I didn't want to do drugs anymore, but I didn't want to live life without doing drugs. And the life was just being squelched out of me. It was a slow death. I had one auditing session uh, in Scientology, and I never did drugs again or had the urge to do drugs again. Is there any stigma to it professionally for you? I think it's a, it's, it's been, you know, if not only an asset, but most of the reason I'm still here. But there is another side to the Scientology story. Front page reports of the mysterious death of a Scientologist in Florida. Allegations of virtual prison camps. What's so secret with this organization? What's so secret with this area? What happened here? And charges by former members of mistreatment and abuse. All you know is that the things you hope for and the, the, the group that you invested your life in is a fraud and a, and a dangerous, horrifying, terrifying fraud, a nightmare. Again and again while reporting this story, we were confronted by Scientology's split personality. On one hand, we were introduced to numbers of devoted followers who told us the church had turned their lives around. On the other hand, we met many former members who described Scientology as a dangerous and deeply paranoid organization. The root of this contradiction, many told us, lies in the peculiar personality of Scientology's founder, L. Ron Hubbard. Do you ever think that you might be quite mad? Oh, yes. The one man in the world who never believes he's mad is a madman. L. Ron Hubbard has been described by his supporters as a genius, by his critics as a madman. If I took one word to describe L. Ron Hubbard, it would be friend. Mike Render is one of Scientology's top leaders. Every few thousand years, a man comes along who is so extraordinary that he changes the course of history. And L. Ron Hubbard is one of those men. Where did this prophet of Scientology come from? L. Ron Hubbard was a modestly successful pulp fiction writer in the 1930s and 40s. In a letter to his wife, he predicted, I will smash my name into history so violently it will take a legendary form. In 1950, at age 39, he published a book that would make him famous, Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health. In it, he claimed to have found nothing less than the secret to the human mind. There was a chasm between this existence, where we are now, and a higher plateau of existence. Hubbard promised that he could make a person into a kind of Superman, raise IQs, cure sicknesses, and enable people to leave their bodies and travel through time and space. Tens of thousands of Hubbard's followers take this as the gospel truth. What if we have found something that does work? Just that. What if that's true? Isn't that worth a look? Cartney Weirn joined the church at age 14. Today, he's a script writer in Los Angeles. He credits Scientology with his success. OK, that's kind of the payoff that we wanted to get at the, at the end. This is real. It works. The effect that it's going to have in a broad way on everything in your life, you know, you can't calculate the worth of that. What Weirn and others say has transformed their lives is the mysterious practice Scientologists call auditing. At the center of an auditing session is a device called an e-meter. It sends a small electrical current through a person's body, 
registering minute physical changes in the skin. Scientologists believe it can also literally measure thoughts. Any reason not to begin session? None at all. The church would not allow 2020 to videotape auditing, but for the first time they released these pictures of what they say is an actual auditing session. Locate an incident when you took the emotion of sorrow. I believe it was 1949. According to Hubbard, okay. the mind is an archive of physical and emotional traumas. During auditing, a person is asked to re-experience these painful events, sometimes from previous lives, hundreds or even thousands of years ago. Is there an earlier incident when you took the emotion of sorrow? 1814. What happened? I was just walking out across this battlefield after the firing had ceased. I just dead and mutilated bodies. Once relived, Scientologists believe, the painful memory is erased and replaced by understanding and a blissful feeling of relief. Thank you very much. Your needle is floating. Thank you. I know the way I feel when I come out of a session. I feel happy and, and outgoing and exuberant. That's how it makes me feel because I've solved something. Auditing is arranged in a progression of levels that Hubbard called the bridge to total freedom. The first significant goal on the bridge, Hubbard told his followers, is the state of clear. Hi, everybody. Once this goal is reached, Scientologists declare themselves problem free. That I've never, ever felt so wonderful. I've never been so aware and that nothing is going to hold me back. But some critics have called auditing a money-making scheme. As soon as your auditor comes out, you go in session. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sessions start at less than $100 an hour, but could rise steeply to more than $600 an hour. To reach the state of clear can cost tens of thousands. If it wasn't worth it to me, I wouldn't be paying for it. If it was 10 times the amount that I had to pay for it, I'd find the money to do it. And if it was 100 times more, then I'd pay that too. In fact, the most dedicated Scientologist will spend tens of thousands more to follow Hubbard's bridge to its mysterious upper levels. This is where Hubbard reveals his final secret. Scientologists are now told only one thing stands between them and absolute spiritual freedom. It involves an intergalactic incident that took place 75 million years ago. Only through more auditing, Hubbard says, can they be liberated at last. The church considers these secret levels sacred. We agree not to divulge their precise contents in return for access to the church and its members. But please don't let them take that stuff out. This is what happened when please. former church member Dennis Ehrlich posted the secret levels on the internet back in 1995. Armed with a court order obtained under copyright laws, Scientology officials staged a surprise raid on Ehrlich's home. Accompanied by local police, Church officials carted away computers, disk drives, and Ehrlich says, personal files. I have not yet seen anything, and I haven't got, a, I haven't got an inventory of anything. The idea that any court would open up my house to my enemies in that manner to go through my personal belongings in that way for seven hours, and, and it was just beyond belief. Before becoming a leading church critic, Dennis Ehrlich was a member of its elite priesthood the so-called Sea Organization. Today's Sea Org members dress in naval-style uniforms, live and eat communally, and sign billion-year contracts with the organization to achieve a goal they describe as freeing the planet. The Sea Organization is named for a group of zealous Scientologists who took to the seas with L. Ron Hubbard aboard a ship he named the Apollo. The year was 1967. Scientology was under investigation from Africa to the United States. In Australia, it was outlawed as a threat to the community, medically, morally, and socially. With nowhere else to go, Hubbard began to wander the Mediterranean, like Moses in the desert, searching for a promised land for Scientology. I became willing to follow him through hell and high water. A young nurse named Hannah Whitfield was one of Hubbard's original Sea Org members. But instead of a magnanimous leader, Whitfield says, 
she found in Hubbard a man increasingly prone to violent fits of temper. He would whine and cry out and, and, and express outrage at this or that or the other. And um, that would go on for days. According to Whitfield and others, Hubbard ordered rule breakers confined to the ship's chain locker for days at a time, including once a four-year-old boy. On another occasion, witnesses say, Hubbard ordered wayward crew members to be shoved overboard while the Apollo was docked in port. A Scientology magazine at the time depicted the ceremony. And those who were wailing or prostrate with fear were just grabbed and shoved over the ship into the harbor. There was a, like a, uh, a little ceremony that grew up that was like a, a, I don't know, a joke, like a fun thing. Okay, I commit my sins to the deep and I arise a better man. People would jump off the side. Mike Render, now a senior church official, joined the sea organization when he was just a teenager. He remembers life aboard the Apollo very differently. Did you ever see him punish anyone, for example, by putting them in solitary confinement in the chain locker? No, never, never. So no, it, how do you now prove that never took place? All I can do is tell you, no, it didn't happen. You were caught in a huge contradiction then. A man you admired, a man you had serious doubts about. It was a very unique trap. As the door was closing behind me, I didn't know it was a trap. A small percentage of people left. The rest of us stayed. And wait until you see what Hannah Whitfield says happened next. Tom Jarrell will be back with more in a moment. The so-called rehabilitation camps, where the Church of Scientology sends those who stray. I was locked in this room in the dark for however long it was. Accusations of being held captive, mistreated, interrogated for disloyalty to the church. When 2020 Sunday continues. Into the Church of Scientology. Is it a religion like other mainstream religions, or is it, as critics charge, a secretive and destructive cult? We go back now to 1975. Scientology and its founder, L. Ron Hubbard, are already being investigated around the world. And after years of self-imposed exile aboard his ship, the Apollo, Hubbard has decided to drop anchor in the United States. After wandering the seas for more than five years, Hubbard finally came ashore here in the sleepy retirement town of Clearwater, Florida. His goal was to establish an international mecca for Scientology. But according to many insiders, Hubbard was growing more and more vindictive toward those who stood in his way. He created what he called the Rehabilitation Project Force. The people who are assigned to this camp are the worst of the worst. They're, the, they're criminals in Scientology. Hannah Whitfield says the RPF was, in effect, a work camp to rehabilitate Sea Org members accused of insubordination. In May 1978, she says, it was her turn. I had two big men on either side of me who pretty much manhandled me into this room with no windows and it was just a mattress on the floor. And I was locked in this room in the dark for however long it was. Whitfield says that while she was in the RPF, she lived in the garage of the church-owned Fort Harrison Hotel, ate scraps, and worked at hard labor up to 12 hours a day. What was your crime to have been put into this, this harsh program to begin with? My crime was, in a Scientology sense, a very serious one. I was accused of having negative thoughts about Mr. Hubbard. The Rehabilitation Project Force is a part within the C organization where people who have, you know, been goofing up, they can go rehabilitate themselves. After our interview, the church apparently launched a letter writing campaign. Renda sent us scores of letters from current and former Sea Org members, all addressed to ABC, and all extolling the benefits of the RPF. While on the RPF, I learned how to work hard and be a productive person. I came out of it extroverted, ethical, and more willing to confront life. What I handled was getting to the root of why I was so bad in my transgressions against others. But some former members we talked to described their experience as physically and psychologically punishing, and anything but voluntary. 
I was certainly completely at their mercy. Dennis Ehrlich claims that for one 10-day period, he was actually put under lock and key in the boiler room of the Fort Harrison Hotel. In the middle of one of the rooms was a uh, chicken wire enclosure uh, with a door that, that had a lock on it. And I was placed in there, and, the, and uh, the lock was put on the door. At the time, Vaughn and Stacy Young were high-level public relations officials in the church. At 4 in the morning, um, one night, Vaughn and I were asleep, and there was a knock on the door, and two security guards were there, and they took me away and to the prison camp. Stacy Young says she was assigned to the RPF for disobeying an order to interrogate a fellow staff member. For part of the time, Young says she was in a room on the seventh floor of the Los Angeles church. Her husband admits he stood by and did nothing to try to get her out. You're being challenged that, you know, what are you? Are you disloyal? Do you, you know, you love your wife more than freedom for the planet? You're, you're going to let people suffer? You know, all this, all this crap is dumped on you. What are you supposed to say? I didn't see Vaughn for several months. I didn't hear from him. I didn't have any correspondence with him whatsoever. He did nothing to try and um, rescue me. I felt that my husband should have rescued me. You know, I didn't take her out. I, I, I look back at that. That's, I should have just picked her up. I should have just picked her up, and I should have just said, if anybody touches me, you're dead. Even after Stacy's release from the RPF, the Youngs remained loyal. But in 1988, Vaughn Young says, the church turned on him, too, and he began his own 13-month stint in the RPF. As you go through interrogations, hour after hour, day after day, week after week, month after month, breaking you down, breaking you down, breaking you down. Travel between buildings is accompanied by a security guard. An RPF member may not speak unless spoken to. If dismissed, must sign a confession of his crimes. Uh, these are acceptable, I take it. If uh, a priest or a, a monk or a nun was to leave one of those religious orders and come out and say, wow, you know, I had to sleep on straw and I lived in a cell and I couldn't talk to anybody and I had to be celibate. And people would go, but you walked in there knowing that and you were a part of it, so fine that you leave. Don't complain about it. A year after Vaughn's release from the RPF, the young say they had had enough. They threw some clothes in the back of their car and fled. Herbert's policy was, as long as you're with us, we'll leave you alone. But if you speak out against us, we're going to dog you and ruin you and destroy you. And that's exactly what they keep trying to do. The church denies having mistreated the Youngs. They provided 2020 with these documents, in which both of the Youngs write fondly of their experience in the RPF. Vaughn Young says they were coerced. They want it in your own handwriting. So that when, when your handwriting is done, it says, see, we have it in his handwriting. He confessed to this. He did this. Vaughn Young says he was forced to sign a statement he did not believe in, and it was a prerequisite to get out of what he wanted to get away from. Well, you know, what do you want to believe? Do you want to believe what Vaughn Young wrote at the time and signed, or do you want to believe him now saying, well, I didn't mean to write that? Many of their stories, though, about RPF are corroborated in sworn court testimony by up to a dozen other people. Are they all lying? They sat in a room. They figured out what they were going to say. They wrote their bits, they passed them around, they made sure that they were consistent, and yes, they were paid for that. Rinder provided 2020 with this court document, which shows that the Youngs, since 1993, have been paid some $50,000 as expert witnesses in civil suits against the church. But the Youngs, who have separated since our interview, vehemently deny that they are fabricating their stories. In fact, they point out, Similar accounts have been credited by judges and juries in a number of court cases. In one example, former Sea Org member Lawrence Wallesheim won a multi-million dollar judgment against the church. An appeals court judge wrote that while in the RPF, Wallesheim had been forced to undergo a strenuous regime that lasted 19 hours a day. When he tried to escape the RPF, the judge wrote, several Scientology members seized Wallesheim and held him captive. They censor the phone calls. Uh, you're not allowed to speak to anyone who's critical. There was no way for anyone to reach me. 
Scientology has projected a kinder, gentler, more understanding image in recent years. But critics insist that RPF camps continue to exist today. Sworn affidavits point to one at this site, a multi-acre spread near Palm Springs, which the church calls the Castile Canyon School. What is the Castile Canyon School? It's a school for the children of Sea Org members. We have seen sworn statements this also is an RPF camp. Is that true? Uh, there are RPF people there, yeah. ABC asked Mike Render if we could take our cameras and go to the school to talk to those inside, but he refused. With a helicopter. Earlier, when German filmmaker Peter Reichelt and his crew set out to see what they could find, this is what happened. You're blocking us. You're arresting us. You are not allowed to do that. A mile from the school, the Germans' way was blocked by carloads of Scientologists. According to the German filmmakers, senior church official Ken Hoden detained them for more than two hours. I'm giving you one last warning. Are you going to leave, yes or no? Fine! I'm placing you under citizen's arrest right now. What's so secret with this organization? What's so secret with this area? What happened here? What is all the secrecy about? What else goes on behind the walls of church compounds? Tom Gerald will have more in a moment. Fighting the IRS, investigating journalists, and allegedly going after former followers. You find their weak spot and you expose it. You literally destroy them. But John Travolta and Kirstie Alley speak out for the religion that changed their lives when 2020 Sunday continues. After this, from our ABC station, continues. And now, Diane Sawyer. And now, Tom Gerald picks up his report at a turning point for the Church of Scientology. For 25 years, the church has been at war with the Internal Revenue Service over its tax status as a religious organization. In the mid-70s, 11 top leaders were sent to prison for breaking into the IRS, stealing documents, bugging offices. But after the death of L. Ron Hubbard, the new church leaders renounced the illegal tactics and instead brought scores of lawsuits against the IRS, apparently in an effort to bring the agency to its knees. October 1993, you're watching scenes of an extraordinary event. More than 10,000 Scientologists gather at the Shrine Auditorium in Los Angeles for what's promised to be the most significant announcement in Scientology's history. On October the 1st, 1993, the IRS issued letters recognizing Scientology and every one of its organizations has fully tax exempt. The war with the IRS was over and Scientology had won. The IRS decision was a financial boon for a group that already claimed to be worth in excess of a billion dollars. With the tax advantages enjoyed by the other mainstream religions, Scientology has gone on an international expansion. They own valuable properties around the world and claim a membership of eight million, though others outside the church put the number as low as 150,000. Their religious practices are unconventional. No worship services take place inside the buildings they call churches. In fact, some resemble resorts more than places of worship. In Los Angeles, this church contains a first-class restaurant, a private theater, and saunas. Scientologists stay in luxury hotel rooms upstairs while attending auditing and other courses downstairs. Hello. The so-called Celebrity Center is run by Tom Davis. He's the son of actress Ann Archer, herself a devoted Scientologist for some 20 years. Davis is the face of the new church. My involvement in Scientology is for my life. This is my life's devotion. Davis dropped out of Columbia University as a freshman to join the Sea Organization, where he met his Belgian wife, Nadine. For us, it's a crusade. We're like crusaders. We're like knights in knighthood, <laughs> you know? We're like, a, um, yeah, it, and it's fun. I mean, it's a fun activity to set men free. The Davises, who work an average of 15 hours a day for around $50 a week, spend much of their time disseminating L. Ron Hubbard's teachings. On this day, at a literacy project in the inner city neighborhood of Compton. I made a decision to forward the aims of Scientology 
I actually compared a little bit like Mother Theresa, you know, who just kind of gives her life to the dedication of setting, you know, helping people, helping the poor and the weak. Scientologists believe this, and not scandal, is the real essence of their religion. You can look at the big origins of almost every religion, mm. and the first so many years are, they're attacked. You take a look at every program we've instilled in either uh, local communities, uh, prisons, uh, drug rehabs. I mean, our statistics are through the roof. But critics say the church may never be able to gain the mainstream acceptance it seeks as long as it remains tethered to the words and ideas of its controversial founder. L. Ron Hubbard left Scientology not only his religious writings, but a series of controversial directives that appear to advocate threats, intimidation, and even attacks against those he regarded as enemies. Some of Hubbard's writings don't ever defend, always attack. The purpose of the lawsuit is to harass and discourage rather than win. A church enemy may be tricked, sued, or lied to, or destroyed. They can send private investigators out to your home or to your place of work, talk to your neighbors. Um, they will illicitly uh, try and obtain copies of your phone bills or credit rating. Uh, they will try and create problems for you at, at your place of employment. They will try and sue you. They'll do everything they can try and do to stop you or to silence you. How do you know? I know because that's what I used to do. Frank Oliver runs a digital graphics firm in Miami. But for four years, he says, he was a member of the church's internal security apparatus. I remember having to make the phone calls to all the phone numbers on someone's phone bill to find out where they had called. These were enemies of the church. You shut them down. You find out what you can about them. You find their weak spot and you expose it. You make it so that they cannot survive or exist. You literally destroy them. Hannah Whitfield says that since she became a paid consultant to families trying to get loved ones to leave Scientology, she's been the target of intense harassment. We've had demonst people demonstrate outside our home. We've had leaflets with terrible accusations in them, you know, distributed around our neighborhood that I'm a murderer, that we're deprogrammers, we torture people, we kidnap them. None of this is true, but it's beside the point. I think that when we were chasing around Hannah Whitfield, that she was very intimidated by this, uh, very disturbed by it. Frank Oliver says he spent three days on a stakeout of the Whitfields in Los Angeles. We followed this woman out of her house. We chased her around. We followed her to the airport. Do you know Frank Oliver? No, I don't know Frank Oliver. He's told us that while working for the church, he personally went through phone records of church uh, uh, people, critics, without their knowledge. He searched their garbage. Uh, he followed them. Well, if Frank Oliver claims that, then Frank Oliver was operating completely outside of the directives and policies of the church, and that's probably why he left. But Frank Oliver says that he left the church in 1992 after six years for very different reasons. The lies just permeated everything. At that point, it was just lies upon lies upon lies. They might feel I betrayed them, but the truth is they betrayed me. Oliver says what finally drove him out of Scientology was the church's request that he participate in a campaign to bring down one of the church's most bitter enemies, the Cult Awareness Network. Can issued warnings about Scientology and other groups calling them dangerous cults. Beginning in 1991, Cann faced a barrage of more than 50 lawsuits brought by Scientologists. Did Scientology, through a large number of lawsuits, set out to destroy the Cult Awareness Network as an organization? No. There were a number of Scientologists who decided to join the Cult Awareness Network to bring some balance to the information that they were providing to people. They were denied uh, membership. The Scientologists sued. Nearly all of them were represented by an attorney named Kendrick Moxon, also a Scientologist. Eventually, Can was forced into bankruptcy, and another Scientologist bought up its name and telephone numbers. Good afternoon, Cult Awareness Network. Today, when you call the Cult Awareness Network, a Scientologist answers the phone. 
Cannes is not the only outside institution that has taken on the church only to face its wrath. In 1991, Time magazine published this cover story written by Richard Behar, which remains one of the most scathing pieces ever published about Scientology. In the aftermath, the church brought a $415 million libel suit, and according to Behar, dispatched as many as 10 private investigators to follow him, contact his family and friends, and illegally obtain his credit report. It's been a chilling effect for the media. I know that when reporters and media companies consider writing about this subject, they're often afraid to do it in an in-depth way. Scientology's lawsuit against time was dismissed. While the church denies most of Behar's allegations, they do not deny investigating him. There were certainly investigators looking into what was it that motivated his, um, what was it that motivated his campaign. Were the investigators authorized to trail him, to phone him, to uh, spread literature in the building where he worked, to uh, dig through his garbage, and that type of things? The investigators were authorized to do whatever was within the law to investigate and find the motives behind Richard Beha. But no amount of effort by the church has been able to slow a torrent of sensational news stories about the recent mysterious death of a young Scientologist. She spent the last 17 days of her life here at the Fort Harrison Hotel. And once again, the church's strict adherence to Hubbard's teachings may have played into the hands of the church's harshest critics. Lisa McPherson was a vibrant and devout Scientologist for 18 years. In the last year of her life, she turned over nearly $60,000 of her income to the church. But in 1996, friends say, McPherson began to display odd behavior. On November 11th, after a minor traffic accident in Clearwater, Florida, she stripped off her clothes and began to walk naked down the street. McPherson was taken to a local hospital for a psychiatric exam, but she refused treatment. In this, she was following the dictates of L. Ron Hubbard, who despised psychiatrists and believed he knew best how to treat mental illness. Hours later, she was released to a group of Scientologists who had come for her. In the final weeks of her life, while she lived in a room in the church-owned Fort Harrison Hotel, McPherson's Scientologist caretakers took detailed handwritten notes, which describe her mental and physical decline. November 19th. If she starts talking, she talks and talks. Then she stares at a spot. November 22nd. She refused to eat and spit out everything she took. Her breath was foul. She went violent and hit me a few times, telling me in a rage she was to kill me. I called in the guard. She's spitting. She's yelling, she's screaming, and they're restraining her. Ken Dandar is representing the McPherson family in a lawsuit against the church. The notes show she was so weak from malnutrition and dehydration that she couldn't even walk anymore. Those people loved Lisa McPherson. Those people did everything that they possibly could to assist her when she needed help. Uh, she came to them for assistance, and they provided it. Rinder points out that some of the notes seem to reflect a genuine concern on the part of McPherson's Scientology caretakers. December 2nd, she is resting now. She originated that she knows we are trying to help her, although she doesn't know our names. Three days later, Scientologists drove McPherson to a hospital 45 minutes away to see a Scientologist physician, bypassing four closer hospitals. She was dead on arrival. An autopsy revealed she was covered in bruises and insect bites, and at 5 foot 11 inches, weighed only 108 pounds. The medical examiner concluded her death at age 34 had been caused by prolonged dehydration, but experts retained by the church say her death was purely accidental. She died, unfortunately, of a pulmonary embolism, something that is both sudden unpredictable, and in many cases is untreatable. Why, when it appeared she was physically deteriorating, wasn't she taken to a hospital? I don't know what happened, Tom. I wasn't there. I just know what it was that she died of, and I know what a pulmonary embolism is. And do you know the church had no complicity in her death? Sure. Sure. All they had to do was take her to the local emergency room 
where all the Scientologists go, but they chose to keep her inside the hotel and watch her die. Is that an accident? That's not an accident. That's intentional. Last month in Florida, criminal charges were brought against the Church of Scientology in the death of Lisa McPherson. The church is accused of abusing or neglecting a disabled adult. It has pleaded not guilty. Tom Jarrell will be back in a moment. John Travolta and Kirstie Alley step up to defend their beliefs, claiming a handful of defectors are the source of Scientology's troubles. If you divorce a woman and, you, and she gives me your version of why she left you, how valid do you think it is? When 2020 Sunday continues. The Alley in defense of Scientology. It is partly because of stars like them that the church has made such great inroads in the United States. But as Tom Jarrell tells us, that's not the case everywhere. Munich, Germany. Nowhere have the attacks on Scientology been stronger than here. Gunther Bechstein is the interior minister of the state of Bavaria. If Scientology is a danger, they want to have a Scientology society. They want to clear the planet and all the others have to obey. In their zeal to contain Scientology, the German government has raided churches, banned Scientologists from political parties, and openly discriminated against Scientologists who might apply for government jobs. For no other reason than he was a member of the Church of Scientology. Typically, Scientology is fighting back. Recently, John Travolta testified before a congressional committee on Germany. Make your blood boil a little bit. Uh, well, I mean, it's a... Uh, there's there's no it's beyond blood boiling we're talking about you know uh worldwide survival here do you know i sat across from a german minister a high official in their government and he deplored scientology in the strongest of terms he equated it with the fear of the rise of nazism uh, that this could be another fascist movement oh that's a shame uh, because scientology wants a world without war without criminality and without insanity and i want to be part of any group that wants those things there's no question that Scientology, that's a part of Scientology. Mm -hmm. There also is little question that there have been people in Scientology who have run into major problems in their lives as the result of wanting to leave Scientology. If you divorce a woman and, you, and she gives me your version of why she left you, how valid do you think it is? If you've got a group standing over here of millions of Scientologists telling you daily the successes that they have, the wins that they have, the way they're helping people, and you can examine the statistics for yourself, and you have a handful of dissatisfied customers over here, then that's life. You're never going to have a group of anyone without some dissatisfied customers. So say, fine, you don't want to be a Scientologist, go. And about the alleged harassment of those who criticize, including the media. You know the best way to fight somebody is to just expose their crimes. If somebody's attacking me, I'm not gonna like pop them in the nose. If somebody's attacking me, I'm just gonna expose their crimes. That's good enough. Do you feel that, uh, that you need to defend Scientology? No. Never. I've never felt the need to defend anything that was good. I have felt the need to fight for it, but I would fight for anything that I believed in. You feel um, there's been uh, an injustice, you, you, you fight back. That's just a law of nature, do you know what I mean? That's not uh, anything we made up. That's something you do in order to, to survive. If we didn't do that, we wouldn't be here. The 10 most fascinating people of 1998. See if you agree with our list. No, no. <laughs> you just blew it, now everyone knows. Yeah, right, I should, I should <laughs> live so long. And coming up on Wednesday night, a serious issue, a controversial medical diagnosis. It can put grieving parents like these. Sunday night, thank you for being with us. I'm Diane Sawyer. And you are fascinating. Uh, <laughs> how you talk. <laughs> and I'm Barbara Walters, and for all of us here at 2020 Sunday, Wednesday and Friday, have a great week. Good night. A storm is brewing, and it's bringing something with it. Something you've never seen before. Stephen King's Storm of the Century, February 1999. Make sure you're tuned to Global for The Practice next.